Hi there, Harriet from Millennium Library with John Gavlosky, entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. John will be talking about common garden insects that can be found in Manitoba as well as across the prairies. Before we get the ball rolling and to keep you up to date, I'd like to mention that we have a number of gardening resources as well as information for the gardeners of all levels. This includes print resources, as well as our RB Digital and Overdrive services for ebooks and e-audiobooks, and gardening e-magazines such as Backyard and Garden Design Ideas, ABC Organic Gardener Magazine, Gardener's World, Grow to Eat, and so many more. Browse and download ebooks and e-magazines using your Winnipeg Public Library card at winnipeg.ca forward slash library. We also have a gardening info guide that contains links, book suggestions on subjects such as growing food, harvesting, challenges you might face, as well as greening your space, a variety of different types of information and resources. Click on info guides at guides.wpl.winnipeg.ca or go to our website to find this and our other helpful guides. I'm John Gablowski, entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development based in Carmen. And today I'm going to be talking about common garden insects. Uh, insects that we can find in our backyards, our gardens in Manitoba and across the Canadian prairies. Well, first of all, to begin with, insects are an incredibly diverse group. They make up uh, probably over half of all living things. If we were to take all the living plants and animals on the earth and put them into a pie plate, roughly half that pie plate would be insects. There are uh, about 80% of all species of animals on the earth are insects. And uh, just how many have we found? If we look at the numbers, roughly just over a million species have been given names. So we, we know that there's over a million species of insects. There's a lot more that haven't been named and found yet. So uh, the best estimate is that there's about five and a half million insect species. And just to put that into perspective, uh, there's roughly 10,000 species of birds in the world. And right now we're over a million species of insects that have had names put to them. So there's over a hundred times more insect species than bird species. So an incredibly diverse group. The biggest group of insects is actually the beetles. Um, so right now we're up to about 386,000 beetle species in the world. And the butterfly and moth group is also extremely large. About 157,000 species have had names put to them. Most of those are moths. About 20,000 of them are butterflies. So what are insects doing in your garden? First of all, there's going to be a lot of insects in any garden, unless you've uh, applied insecticides to it. Uh, most gardens will have a lot of insects in them, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You need insects for some of your crops to grow. At home, we grow raspberries and uh, some fruit crops that need pollinators. If you have apple trees in your yard, you won't get apples unless you have pollinators. If you have raspberries, you won't get raspberries unless there's pollinators. A lot of crops rely on them. Uh, there's insects that are eating other insects. So we've got biocontrol happening in any garden or farm situation. We have insects that eat weeds and weed seeds. There's insects that decompose the crop stubble. And there's insects that help improve your soil. Now, most of my presentation will be focusing on some of the things that eat your plants and some tips on what you can do about them. But we do have to keep in mind, we have all these other insects that are doing all these great things. And we don't want to be taking out uh, all the beneficial insects in, in our attempts to get rid of some of the plant feeding ones. So insects I'm going to cover include grasshoppers. I'm going to cover three groups of sap feeding insects, thrips, aphids, and spittlebugs. Some beetles, a few moths and their larvae that are found in the garden, uh, a few flies, and we're going to finish with a beneficial insects quiz. I've picked out several insects in the garden that are beneficial, that it's good if we can recognize what they are. So hang around for that and we'll test your knowledge on good bugs. And we'll start with grasshoppers. In Manitoba, we've got about 85 different types of grasshoppers. And there's really four species that we consider to be potential pest species. They can build their populations up very quickly, especially in dry years. 
and they will feed on a lot of different things. Now, the grasshoppers on the right in the screen, they've got some bigger antenna and they're quite green. These are katydids, they're not one of the pest species. They do a lot of singing in August and September. They can be really abundant in some areas, but they don't really do a lot of damage to your uh, garden plants and crop plants. The one on your right, two-striped grasshopper, that's one of our potential pest species. So when populations get high, they can sometimes become a bit of a nuisance. Now grasshoppers, at least all our pest species, they do overwinter as eggs. They start hatching out usually in early June. They're usually about the size of a wheat grain when they're very small. So the one on the upper right in the photo is a newly hatched grasshopper. And then they go through about five or six stages where their wings get bigger and bigger and bigger until at some point in July they can usually fly and they will move greater distances and then they can move around from area to area and plant to plant. One thing that can help keep the grasshoppers in check is a beneficial fungus. It only infects grasshoppers and only certain species of grasshoppers. And uh, in some years when we have a lot of rain and humidity and the fungus gets going, the grasshopper populations will decline because of this. Uh, if you start seeing dead grasshoppers clinging to the top of your plants, they've likely got this fungus. When this fungus infects them, they naturally want to climb to the top of the plants and they die clinging to the top of the plants. The fungus builds up in their body and eventually their cuticle splits open and the, being high in the canopy, then the fungus can travel and infect other grasshoppers. So a bit of moisture um, throughout the summer can help build that fungus up and help take the grasshoppers down a bit. There's also several things that eat grasshopper eggs. I've got a few of them pictured here, the bee fly on the upper left. Uh, you will see these flying around later in the summer. They almost look like a bee. They mimic bees quite well, actually. They lay their eggs right next to grasshopper eggs and their larvae eat the grasshopper eggs. Blister beetles, there's certain species that will do the same thing. They lay their eggs close to grasshopper eggs and the young eat them. And even field crickets are, have been known to dig up and eat grasshopper eggs as part of their diet. And the one on the lower right is a ground beetle. You will likely have lots of ground beetles around any yard. They're very abundant. We've got over uh, 300 species of ground beetles in Manitoba, and there's over 900 species in Canada. Very abundant group of beetles. And they're patrolling the soil, looking for things like cutworms, grasshopper eggs, small caterpillars. Some species will even climb plants and feed on aphids. So very diverse and very beneficial group of beetles, the ground beetles. Now I'm gonna get into the three groups I said we'd cover for sucking insects, things that feed on the sap of your plants. The first of these is thrips. Thrips are very small insects. They're tiny little things. Usually when you see them on the plant, they look like debris or dirt or something if they're adults and they're black. The young often are yellow. And again, they look like little bits of pollen because they're only a couple millimeters long. But if you watch them, they'll eventually move around. If you're not sure what they are, tap them into a tray or onto a piece of paper and they'll start moving around. The way these feed is they have what we call scratch and suck mouth parts. So they will scratch the surface of the plant, make it bleed a little bit, and then they suck up the juice. Where they've scratched the plant, you get a little white spot. And when you have a lot of thrips feeding, you get white patches on the leaves. So if you start to see that, that's thrips. The next group of sap feeding insects is aphids. And aphids are an extremely diverse group. There's 847 species of aphids known in Canada, so a lot of different types. And probably every plant will have at least one aphid species that feeds on it. Now, what's unique about aphids is they can build their populations up extremely quickly. The aphids you see early in the year are all females. There will be absolutely no males in the population. The way aphid populations work Things start out as strictly female. Those females don't have to mate to lay eggs. They just start producing eggs in their body, which hatch inside their body and they give birth to live young. And those young 
start developing eggs in their body after a week or two. And again, they're giving birth to these live young. And again, no mating is occurring. This allows them to build their populations up extremely quickly to get things going in the year. Now, later in the season, males will start being produced and then they will mate and uh, produce offspring like other insects do. Uh, that way you get a bit of genetic mixing happening in the population. Early on, basically you've got females producing clones of themselves and building the population up extremely quickly. The other thing aphids can do, they feed on the sap. They have to eat a lot of sap to get the nutrients they need. So they produce a sticky fluid called honeydew. And this honeydew coats the leaves. It can be a little bit on the sticky side. And if you've ever had your car parked under a tree that had a lot of aphids, uh, you might have a sticky car the next day. Uh, that's because of the honeydew. Now, one good thing is a lot of things like to eat aphids. They're a really good meal for a lot of things. And we'll cover some of that a bit later, but that's what really helps keep their populations in check. A lot of predators like to eat them. There's fungal pathogens that will also get into the population and uh, kill some of the aphids. And especially when we have warm, moist weather, we'll get some of these fungal pathogens in the population. And heavy rains can also knock aphids off of plants and kill them. So if you've got some aphids building up in your garden uh, and you get a heavy rainstorm, that might knock things back. The other thing you can do, if it's just a few plants that have a lot of aphids, you could take a garden hose and basically create a heavy rainstorm for them and wash them off the plants and probably uh, kill a lot of them and free the plants of at least the heavier aphid populations. Now, if the aphids do get too abundant, one option for controlling them that is somewhat selective and won't harm bees and pollinators and a lot of the good bugs is called insecticidal soap. And this is something a person can make themselves at home with soap and water dilute it to the right amount, or you can buy commercially available uh, uh, formulations of insecticidal soap. They're sold in most hardware stores and garden centers will have insecticidal soap. You spray this on, you have to make sure you get good coverage, and uh, if you make contact with the aphids, the aphids will get killed, but again, it's very selective and you won't be killing uh, bees and pollinators and things. On the label, you may see the words potassium salts of fatty acids. That's basically soap. So that's what it'll say on the container label, but that is essentially soap. The other thing that can be quite effective in taking aphids down is parasitoids. And these are tiny little insects. Usually parasitoids are flies or wasps. And the, the example I'm using here is a wasp called aphidius. And what aphidius does is they will lay eggs into aphids and their young live inside the aphids and the aphid will die and basically become a home for that wasp young. And when the aphids die, they tend to inflate a little bit to become a nice home. And we call them aphid mummies. They look like little bronzy or um, pale globular balls on the plant at that point. And you might even see a hole in the end where the adult wasp has come out of the aphid mummy eventually. And I've got a video here that will show uh, just how these wasps lay their eggs into the aphids. Now you're gonna have to watch this quickly because they whip their abdomen around really quickly and lay their egg in, it's extremely quick. So see if you can see this happening in the video. aphids had taken over the crop, but their reign was ending. Enter Aphidius Irvi, a parasitoid capable of ravaging their populations. Our hero makes quick work of the aphids in record speed, turning these pesky yield suckers into a living host. Growing an army of crop defenders to fight another day. So that's Aphidius Irvi. We do have those in Manitoba. Uh, they've actually been released in some areas too, and you can actually purchase those for greenhouses to help control uh, greenhouse crop pests as well. So the, the last uh, sap feeder I'm going to cover isn't really a pest, but it's something that you will sometimes see, especially when we get wetter 
weather. This is called spittle bugs. And again, not really a crop pest. What spittle bugs do is they don't really feed on the, um, the sap the plant is making in the leaves, the nutritious sap. They feed on the water coming up from the roots, making its way up through the plant. This is called xylem fluid. So basically it's water with a few uh, minerals in it and a little bit of nutrients. But that's what spittle bugs are feeding on. And they make themselves this really interesting little home. They basically are um, blowing bubbles out their back end and they create this bubbly shelter for themselves. These bubbles are fortified with um, some uh, extra things from glands in the side of their abdomen. So they become uh, quite sticky bubbles. And if you try to poke at these, they don't break that easy. You can pull them apart and see the little uh, leaf hop or the spittle bug inside, which is shown on the right in the screen. Um, but again, they, they don't really do a lot of damage with their feeding, but you do get these little, it almost looks like spit on the plants. And if you have a lot of them, it looks like someone's been spitting in your garden. But uh, again, this is just spittle bugs. Um, it's more of an aesthetic thing. You really don't need to be spraying for these. Um, so if you see that, it's really not much harm to the plants. So we'll move on to just a few more insects that will feed on the plants and will chew the plants. And one that will feed on potatoes and tomatoes and anything in that potato family is the Colorado potato beetle. And they, they've been a pest for quite a while in Manitoba and the prairies. And people have been at battle with them for a while to try to get good control. Now what you see on the screen here in the middle, there's a clump of yellowish eggs. Those are Colorado potato, potato beetle eggs. Just above the eggs, is a cluster of young larvae. So these have just hatched out. On your right is a more fully grown larva. On the left is the adult Colorado potato beetle. Now the battle people have been having is getting good control. And the mistake a lot of people will use is they'll find something that seems to work for them and they keep on using it. And potato beetles are really good at developing resistance to insecticides. They've developed feeding on a plant that produces its own toxins and they are very good at detoxifying things. So if you're using insecticides to control them, insecticides belong to different groups. So some are very similar in the way they work. And what you need to do is rotate between different groups of insecticides. And if you're not familiar with what an insecticide group is, and you want to learn more about that, we do have information on our Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development website. We have a fact sheet showing those groups. You can look that resource up and try to figure out what groups you should be rotating to to get good control. Now, another defoliator I want to cover is another beetle. It's actually a very interesting looking beetle, the lily leaf beetle, kind of a very bright red, almost uh, pinkish beetle with a black underside to it. So quite attractive, but they like to feed on lilies and they can actually do quite a bit of foliation. What you see on the right is the larva. So these are both, uh, the two things in this picture on the lower right are both lily leaf beetle larvae. Now one is coated in what looks like dirt or grease or something. That's actually its own feces. They make something called a fecal shield for themselves. They basically coat themselves in their own feces. Apparently it makes them less tasteful to predators and things that would like to eat them. And probably to homeowners who would want to handle them and knock them off their plants. The one on the uh, left in that picture is one where that fecal shield has been removed. So that's what they look like when you remove that fecal shield. Now, if they do build up on your lilies and you just have a few plants, one option is just physical removal. The adults in particular, you can knock them off the plants really easy. Just take a bucket of water, put a little bit of soap, just a few drops of soap or something into it to break the surface tension and you can knock them off the plants. And same with the larvae, you can knock them off the plants, but some people might uh, find their fecal shields a bit objectable to be handling. Another beetle that we'll cover is something called sap beetles. And these really aren't a huge garden pest unless you have uh, 
berries and fruit that is starting to get a little bit on the overripe side. So some people will call these beer bugs or picnic beetles. I've heard a lot of different names, but sap beetle is the proper common name. They're little black beetles with uh, the species we have common here has four yellow dots on its back. And again, they like fermenting things. So things that are getting a bit overripe. So if you've got raspberries in your garden or strawberries, uh, and you've in the past had sap beetle issues, try to get them harvested before they get too overripe because that's when the sap beetles would, will become more interested in them. And if sap beetles are becoming a nuisance, you might wanna have your compost bin, if you have one located a little ways away from the garden, uh, they do seem to like to get into compost bins and feed in there. That will draw them into an area too. Now, another beetle that I'll cover is called flea beetles. These are really tiny little beetles. They call them flea beetles for a couple reasons. They're tiny, just a few millimeters long. They will also hop like a flea. They will jump when disturbed. And we've got different types. There's about 72 species in Manitoba. But we've got a couple species that like to feed on cabbages and broccoli and cauliflower and anything in that crucifer family of plants. And they can become a real nuisance, especially early in the season when they're feeding on the young seedlings and late in the season in August when the adults are occurring once again and they're moving into the crop closer to harvest. Flea beetles are a really tricky one to deal with. If you've just got a little row of cabbages or broccoli, uh, one option might be row cover to keep them out at the appropriate time. Um, there are insecticides registered, but you really have to be on top of them. They can be a real challenge for people growing cruciferous vegetables. But just so I don't give flea beetles a totally bad name, there's also good flea beetles. Uh, the species I'm showing here is a species that feeds on nothing but leafy spurge. Leafy spurge is an invasive weed. It uh, doesn't belong in Manitoba but it is established and it's become a real nuisance in pastures and along the roadsides and things. Uh, to control this weed, three different species of flea beetles were brought over from where the weed originated over in Eurasia and released here in Manitoba. These three species eat absolutely nothing but leafy spurge. And so they, they can do a decent job controlling the weed. So you've got bad flea beetles that eat plants, you've got good flea beetles that eat weeds. Next one I'll cover is, uh, I'm going to cover a couple of caterpillars that eat cruciferous vegetables. The first one I'll cover is called diamondback moth. And it's called diamondback because of the pattern on the adult's back. But what I'm showing you here is the young green caterpillar that is the larva stage and it's pupa. So these are what you will see on your plant. The young caterpillars, again, like cabbage and broccoli and things like that. And it, it can make the, the aesthetics of the plant uh, not too pleasing when you're trying to produce a good cabbage. Now, diamondback moth don't overwinter well here. They blow in, they get caught in wind currents and they get blown into Manitoba. Some years we get a lot dumped in certain regions. Other years we barely see them. So what we do annually is we put up a series of traps across Manitoba. So provincially we put up about 80 or 90 of these traps, usually in canola fields. That's often where the diamondback moth end up showing up. And we monitor these usually from very early May till about the end of June. And we try to predict what the diamondback moth populations might be like and where they're showing up. And if you're interested in this, we do post the data on our Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development website so you could access the data there if you're curious what's happening in your region. And if you look really carefully on the moth on the right side of your screen, you can see what looks like a series of about three diamond patterns on the back. That's why they call this diamondback moth. Another green caterpillar that will feed on cabbage is called the imported cabbage worm. Adults are called cabbage butterflies. Those are the white butterflies you see flying all over the place in July and August. And even now you'll start to be seeing the odd one. It's about mid-June right now. They're, they'll be starting to fly around. Uh, later in the season though, you will see the green caterpillars on cruciferous vegetables. And much like diamondback moth, they will feed directly on the plants. Now, if these caterpillars have become a real nuisance and you want something 
somewhat selective to control them that won't harm the bees and the ladybugs and things like that. One option is a group of chemicals based on a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. And in the uh, hardware stores or garden centers, you'll see it sold as BTK or possibly Dipel. Foray is more a version they use in forestry. Um, Dipel BTK, that's what you'll see on the store shelves. So when you apply this, you're basically uh, applying this Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacteria that is specific only to butterfly and moth larvae. That's the only thing it would kill. So if you apply it on your cabbage plants, you're probably only killing off diamondback moth, uh, imported cabbage worm, and not much else. You do have to apply this when the caterpillars are still fairly young. It basically is messing up their gut a little bit and they stop feeding pretty quickly and they never will become the adult uh, moth or in the case of imported cabbage worm, the white butterfly. And one last caterpillar that I'll cover is cutworms. These are the caterpillars in your garden that will feed early in the season and sometimes even cut plants. Not all do a lot of cutting. Some like the dingy cutworm on the left in the screen will take big chunks of plant material but not do a lot of cutting. Others like the red back cutworm in the middle of the screen will cut plants and you will see them lying on the ground instead of standing straight up. What you see around the cutworm in the middle here are two pupa cases. That's what the pupa stage of the cutworms look like. These would be in the soil. And then usually in um, August and September, the adult moths are flying around laying their eggs. Cutworms come out at night and feed. They hide during the day in the soil or under debris on the soil. So if you are trying to find them, you do have to dig around the affected plants because again, they're good at hiding and they can bury themselves in the soil during the day. Managing cutworms, you've got a few options. You can hand pick them off the plants. You can put little collars around your seedlings when you transplant them. We call them cutworm collars. Some people will use uh, tin cans that they've cut the ends off of or uh, rolls such as uh, toilet paper rolls or whatever, just to make a little collar that can be placed around the stem and keep the cutworms from getting at them. If you're using cutworm collars, make sure they're buried a good inch or so into the soil to be effective. And there are insecticides registered as well if people want to go that option. I'm only going to cover one fly and then we're going to get into our natural enemy or beneficial insect quiz. The fly I'm going to cover is called spotted wing drosophila. It's a newer uh, insect pest issue in the prairie area. So what this is, is a fly, a fruit fly, that lays eggs into fruit and you get these little white larvae that end up inside the fruit. The first time a person brought a sample of these into me at the office, they had mushy raspberries and they were wondering why are they mushy? They couldn't really see any insects or anything. Once we put them under the microscope, uh, we noticed a lot of very tiny white larvae inside the berries. They had been eating basically high protein berries. Uh, they're not harmful if you do end up accidentally eating berries that have them. They're not harmful to you. It's more the grossness factor for a lot of people knowing that there's uh, larvae in the fruit and they will make the fruit go mushy really quickly. Now what's different about this fruit fly than our regular fruit flies that we have always had around here is in the females, the egg layer or in, in the picture here, it's called an ovipositor. This is what they lay the eggs with. Most fruit flies, it's just a straight egg layer, and they can only lay the eggs into overripe fruit. With this species, spotted wing drosophila, that egg layer is a bit serrated like a saw. So they can actually saw their way into fruit that isn't overripe. So when your raspberries or strawberries or uh, Saskatoon berries are still fairly firm, they can get the eggs in there, and it's harder to get the, the produce harvested before they've laid their eggs in. So that's what makes spotted wing drosophila more of a nuisance than some of our other fruit flies. There are traps people can put up to see if they're in the area. Here's one that we put up provincially. There's a network of these that get put up every year in June. And basically it's a cider vinegar mix that uh, it smells like something fermenting and draws them in. They end up in the trap, they get counted weekly. And then we figure out when they've actually started to show up in the area and we can alert people that Spotted wing drosophila is now present. And if you've got soft fruit, now's the time to start um, 
at least assessing your needs. There are ways you can look for the caterpillars or in, sorry, in this case, the larva of the fly in the, the fruit. If you make up a salt solution of basically one quarter salt and four cups of water and you pour that into the fruit, mush it a bit, you'll see the, the larva of the fly come to the surface. So now into the beneficial insects. And before I get into the quiz part, I just want to mention in any garden or any landscape, there is often a lot of very tiny, almost fly-like things that you will find if you look hard enough. A lot of times these are parasitic wasps that are helping control caterpillars uh, and a lot of the things that eat your, your garden plants. The, the example I'm showing here is called Cotesia. These are little wasps. They lay their eggs into caterpillars such as this armyworm. They don't lay just one egg in. They usually lay 20, 30, 40, sometimes even more eggs into an individual caterpillar. The eggs are all the same age. So when the larva of the wasp need to emerge from the caterpillar, it happens almost spontaneously, almost all at once. So um, you get all these wasp larvae emerging from the caterpillar. Very effective biocontrol. And again, this is happening probably in any garden that we have in the province. Now into the natural enemy quiz. I'm gonna go over four or five things real quickly to see if you know what they are. The first one here is a beetle larva. And again, this is fairly common. You will see this in pretty much any garden. It almost looks like a little black grayish alligator. This is a very common beetle. Often the adults are red or orange with dots. These are lady beetle larvae or ladybug is another word for it. Uh, so lady beetle or ladybug larva, they look like little black or grayish alligators. And we have lots of different types of lady beetles in Manitoba. In fact, we've got 66 species. So depending on the species, they may differ a little bit in how they look. The middle picture here is actually the pupa stage. So at the top is the larva, middle is the pupa. It almost looks like a little potato beetle larva, but it's immobile, it's attached to the plant. And of course, people are familiar with the adults. Now, lady beetles eat a lot of aphids. So that's why your aphid populations don't explode on you on an annual basis. In fact, uh, a study here from the University of Guelph looked at a couple of different species of lady beetles. And on average, the older juveniles were eating roughly about 100 aphids per day per individual, as do the adults. It varies a little bit depending on the species, but they eat a lot of aphids. The next one looks like a little brownish alligator. And the hint here is that the adult stage is quite big with lacy wings. That's your clue there. These are called lacewing larvae. And people probably know the adult stage of lace wings. You see these come into the light at night in the summer. They're fairly big. Now we do have different types of lace wings. There's brown lace wings, there's green lace wings. Green lace wings are the more common one in most urban environments. And at least the ones that we see the most. Uh, very uh, lacy, uh, very attractive insect with lacy wings, quite bright green. The larva stage looks like little brown alligators that run around eating things like aphids, insect eggs, and other things. And now here's a video showing you a lacewing larva in action eating aphids. The stealthy lacewing larva approaches its prey. They are called aphid lion for nothing. Attack! The only wing skewers the aphid with her sickle-shaped mandibles and shakes her prey above her head. The lacewing injects the aphid with digestive enzyme and consumes her liquid white dinner. That little one on the left shouldn't stick around. They could be next on the menu. So the videos that I've been showing today, this is a, a series that are being produced. It's called Field Heroes. It's a series of videos uh, produced by entomologists in Western Canada just to draw some attention and raise awareness about beneficial insects, how to identify them, and the role that they have in protecting our plants. 
The uh, next one on our quiz is actually a fly larva. Looks like a slug. Has a kind of a tapered end here with a kind of a hooky mouth part. This is called a hoverfly larva. And the way they function is the larva are usually associated with aphid colonies. The females will lay the eggs right into aphid colonies. And the larvae have these, again, hook-shaped mouth parts. They will impale an aphid with their mouth. They will hold it up and suck the juice out. And it, it almost looks like a, a freezy uh, deflating when they're feeding on the aphid. You can literally see the, the aphid deflating as they're feeding. And then they put this thing down and they'll impale another one, hold it up, deflate it, put it down. So uh, the aphids are basically uh, hoverfly larva freezies. And the adult stage of hoverflies look a bit like wasps or bees. So when you see them, don't confuse them with a wasp or bee. They're very good mimics. There's a lot of different types. We've got almost 540 species in Canada. They will hover near plants. As the name would imply, hoverflies hover. So they will hover in front of the plant before they land. Again, don't confuse them with a bee or a wasp. And uh, just a couple more here on our quiz. The last one is an insect that uh, is quite small, just a few millimeters long, black and uh, white, almost like the pattern you would see on a pirate's flag. And these are called minute pirate bugs. Minute pirate bugs are small. They run around looking for insect eggs, aphids, and things like that to feed on, on your plants. We've got 39 species in Canada. So another one of our beneficials. And the last one that we'll look at here is a sm um, fairly small insect with a long beak on it that likes to impale insects and uh, things like small caterpillars and aphids and feed on them. These are called damsel bugs. And uh, they have a feeding style where they will approach their prey, put their beak in, inject a venom, which kills the prey, and then they suck the juice out. Now, don't worry if you handle these. I handle them all the time. They're harmless to people. When I say venom, they can kill other insects with it. They won't harm a person with it. And just a precaution for anyone who is using insecticides in their garden, you do need pollinators for a lot of your crops to uh, produce properly. The best thing you can do is only spray if needed. Spray as late in the evening as you can. A lot of bees, like honeybees, will go back to the hive in the night and come out during the day the next day. So spraying late is good. And certainly if you know that there's beekeepers around, uh, give them a warning and try to use something that's less toxic to bees as well. We have information on pretty much everything I've covered here on our Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development uh, website. So if you need more info, I'd refer you to our webpage. And just to sum things up, insects are incredibly diverse. You're going to find them in any garden or landscape or yard. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. Again, they do a lot of good. Uh, it's good though to get to know some of the potential pests that could be on your crops know how to deal with them in sustainable ways and know those beneficial insects as well and appreciate the good job that they're doing for you. So we'll wrap it up with that. Now I do have a few things to show as well. So there's a few specimens that um, insects that you will find in your yard and garden that I haven't covered. I'm going to start by showing. This one I'm going to show here will look like wasps and bees. These are your hoverflies. So I mentioned them earlier. Lots of different sizes. Uh, don't confuse them with bees. So in the box I've got here are some brown beetles. And these beetles usually start flying in late May and June. You will often have them pinging off your doors and flying around your lights in the evening. Those are called June beetles. And they will lay their eggs into soil. Uh, often the larva, which is at the bottom in the container of uh, ethanol, 
they will live in your lawn feeding on the grass. In a year where we have good moisture, you probably won't notice it. In dry years, you might get a few brown patches. Um, in the garden, sometimes they will feed on potatoes. So they can be a bit of an issue that way at times. But normally most of them are in the lawn and we usually just start to notice them in years when, um, when it's a bit drier. Now one, another insect I want to show, this is one you probably don't see a lot, but you will hear a lot. These are called cicadas. They're fairly big insects that live up in the trees. And they do feed on tree sap to some degree, but again, not enough to make them a pest. But what is familiar to a lot of people is the sound they make. Cicadas, the, when they're into their uh, mating season, the males will actually do a call that is quite familiar. So I'm going to play the call of a cicada. So hopefully everyone can hear that. So a lot of people mistakenly think it's the hydro lines or something making that sound that you hear in late July through August. That's cicadas. They're up in your trees. Again, not really a pest. Kind of a cool thing that occurs around here. Uh, every late summer. That's the dog day cicada, the sound that I played by the way. There's a few different species of them. Dog day cicada is by far the most common here. So that's the one that you end up hearing and that we have around our yards quite a bit. Now I'm going to show a couple insects that are impressively large. The first one here is a wasp. And I'm going to put my finger in the picture just to give you a bit of perspective how big this is. So this is my thumb you're seeing next to it. Uh, this is a very large wasp. It's called, it's an ichneumonid wasp called Megarissa. And what this wasp does is it's got this big, the, the big thing at the end is an egg layer. It looks like a huge stinger. That's actually an egg layer. And what they do is they lay their eggs into trees. They're trying to put their egg next to another insect called a horntail larva. And the larva of that Megarissa wasp eats the uh, horntail. The reason I'm showing this is there's so much hype right now about Asian giant hornets or murder hornets as some people call them. We already have a lot of really impressively big wasps in Manitoba. So if you do see a big wasp in Manitoba, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be one of these Asian giant hornets. Again, we do have some pretty impressive wasps here already. Uh, the horntails I referred to that the Megarissa feed on, they feed on the larva stage. Uh, these are horn tails. So once again, I'll get a finger into the picture here for uh, comparison's sake. So again, there's my thumb in there. Um, the horn tails are incredibly large insects as well. Do not confuse them again with uh, being an Asian giant hornet. Uh, the odds of Asian giant hornet ever getting to Manitoba are slim. Where they're native to, they do not like prairie environments for one, and they probably wouldn't be able to handle our winters too well. So our odds are actually really slim here in Manitoba for anything like that establishing. Uh, one more thing that I'll show you, just because they're common in many gardens, and um, there's many different types of them. These are called stink bugs. So Stink bugs uh, are a family of true bugs. There's species that are predators of other bugs. There are species that do feed on plants. They're a sap feeder. And the ones that do feed on plants, normally in a garden, uh, they'll feed on things like tomatoes and uh, maybe the sap of some of your, your berry crops. In tomatoes, you will sometimes see little white spots on the tomatoes where they fed. Not really considered a major crop pest, but um, something you will see in your garden fairly frequently. So those are some of the insects that we have in Manitoba. Um, again, just to reiterate, we insects are incredibly diverse. We've got a lot of different species in Manitoba. There's going to be a lot in your garden. Uh, get to know the good guys. Enjoy them. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can see in a garden. Lots of uh, uh, predation and parasitism and things happening on a daily basis. Um, so 
uh, as much as they can sometimes be frustrating and things we have to control and deal with on our plants, they can also be our friends as well. So uh, get to know them and get to enjoy them. Thanks. Thank you so much to John and thank you for watching. Take some time to check out the various titles we have available on garden insects, such as Garden Insects of North America, The Ultimate Guide to Backyard Bugs, Birds, Bees, and Butterflies, Bringing Nature into Your Yard and Garden, as well as The Naturally Bug-Free Garden, Controlling Pest Insects Without Chemicals. And please follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.